In this video, we will delve into two crucial concepts in the realm of quantum mechanics, black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. These ideas played a pivotal role in reinforcing the idea of quantization, which suggests that things at a quantum scale have distinct quantized values. So in our previous video, we discussed how the charge and mass of an electron can be experimentally approximated as discrete values. So the charge of an electron, for example, was determined to be 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, while the mass of an electron was determined to be 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So now let's start with black body radiation. What exactly is a black body? Imagine a hypothetical system or object that absorbs 100% of radiant energy that falls upon it. It reaches an equilibrium temperature and re-emits all the absorbed energy. So despite its name, black bodies aren't necessarily black. They can have a specific color. For example, the sun can be considered a black body. To simplify understanding, think of a black body as an object that soaks up all incoming radiation, like light, without reflecting or transmitting any of it. It absorbs everything. Then it reaches a certain temperature and re-emits all absorbed radiation as a continuous spectrum, not limited to a single wavelength or just one color. For instance, consider three objects at a very low temperature. One is bright green, another is a darker green, and the third is black. All three are exposed to light radiation. The first two objects reflect or transmit some of the light radiation in the green wavelength, hence their green appearance. But the black one absorbs all the radiation, which is why it appears black, making it an ideal black body. Now, as we heat up these objects, the green ones become brighter green, while the black one changes color, gradually shifting towards uh, shorter wavelengths as temperature increases. Keep in mind that the emitted light forms a continuous spectrum, but the wavelength with the most intense radiation, or the peak, on the spectrum determines the color you see. And this is how a black body exhibits a specific color. So to clarify further, here are some made up examples. A black body at 3000 Kelvin appears reddish because it emits more in the red part of the spectrum. A black body around 6000 Kelvin appears white because it emits a balance of all mixed colors in the visible uh, light spectrum. A black body at 10,000 Kelvin appears bluish because it emits more in the blue and violet or UV part of the spectrum. So as a black body's temperature increases, two features become evident. One, the total radiant intensity increases and this is the area under the curve. And two, the peak of the spectrum shifts to shorter wavelengths. To grasp this concept from a chemistry standpoint, picture atoms moving at certain velocities due to their thermal energy. These atoms emit specific wavelengths of light based on their velocity and this is shown by the distance between wave peaks. They also emit differing amounts or intensities of light shown by the thickness of the wave. When temperature rises, atoms move faster, emitting shorter wavelengths and more intense light or thicker uh, waves. And scientists actually understood this. They realized that atoms can both absorb and emit electromagnetic radiation, 
which led to a guy called Rayleigh Jeans, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but he mathematically described the relationship between radiation intensity and wavelengths through the following equation. It actually worked pretty well with observational data until it reached the ultraviolet, ultraviolet region. There, it predicted an infinite increase in intensity, which didn't align with experimental observations. And this discrepancy was given the title, the ultraviolet catastrophe. The name is a bit dramatic, but at the time it was a catastrophe because it challenged classical physics, which treated energy as a wave instead of a particle. So enter Max Planck who made a bold assumption. Energy, or light, is quantized, meaning it comes in discrete packets. In other words, atoms can absorb one or two packets of energy, but not a half. So going back to the atom analogy, imagine it shooting out balls of energy instead of a wave, and the balls get bigger or more intense, and they are shot out more frequently depending on the thermal energy or how fast the atom is moving. So based on this equation, Planck derived a new intensity distribution formula for black body radiation that built upon Rayleigh Jeans's equation. And this equation is shown as follows, where H is Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, K is the Boltzmann's constant, T is absolute temperature in Kelvin, and lambda, or this wavelength symbol, is the wavelength of light in meters. This formula fittingly matched experimental data, further supporting the idea of quantization at a quantum level. But sadly, Planck's breakthrough was only, well, it was a mathematical solution to the problem of energy be behavior, but the theory still needed to be interpreted, meaning a solid theory that was able to experimentally demonstrate quantization needed to be formed. This interpretation was provided by the man himself, Albert Einstein, who connected all these discoveries and explained the photoelectric effect as we will discuss now. So the photoelectric effect. An experiment was conducted by a scientist named Philip Leonard. He used a photocell where light interacted with a metal surface and ejected electrons. By measuring the current and voltage, he aims to understand how light affects these electrons. The expectation was straightforward. When Leonard used a weak ultraviolet light source, he observed that it ejected electrons with a slower velocity. It seemed logical then that a stronger UV source with greater intensity would result in electrons being ejected at a faster speed. In simple terms, more intense light hitting the metal should give uh, electrons more kinetic energy and make them faster. However, just like the puzzle of black body radiation, the experimental results didn't match these expectations. Instead of fast electrons being ejected, just more of the slower electrons were observed to be ejected. It was only when Albert Einstein stepped into the picture to interpret all these observations that everything started to make sense. Einstein recognized that shining light on a metal could liberate electrons. He also knew that shorter wavelengths, shorter wavelength light like UV could free electrons more easily compared to longer wavelength light such as IR or red light. So drawing from Max Planck's notion of light as discrete packets of energy called photons, Einstein suggested that each photon carried a specific wavelength frequency and hence a specific energy. This energy played a pivotal role in releasing electrons. So when the intensity of light increased, 
it merely meant more photons were released, not faster ones. To eject faster ones, you needed higher energy photons. Not only this, but to eject an electron, a certain amount of energy was needed. And this was a one-to-one -one relationship. So for each one photon with enough energy, one electron could be liberated. And to look at this from a chemistry standpoint, again, to break an electron free from certain atomic forces, it must receive enough energy to overcome those forces. This energy wasn't provided by higher frequency light or more of the same thing, but rather through interactions with higher frequency, higher energy photons. So, in summary, if we view light as particles or photons, the theory predicts the following for the photoelectric effect. 1. Increasing intensity increases the number of ejected electrons, but not their energy. 2. Above a minimum energy required to break atomic bonds, kinetic energy increases linearly with frequency. And 3. There exists a cutoff frequency below which no electrons will be emitted regardless of intensity. When we plot kinetic energy against frequency, it aligns perfectly with the photon theory. In essence, this led to help establish the equation for photon energy, which is E equals HF where E is the energy of a photon, H is Planck's constant, and F is frequency. And therefore, again, by plotting kinetic energy versus frequency, we can express the kinetic energy of an electron as a slope, which is analogous to Y equals MX plus B, where uh, KE equals HF minus, H, uh, minus W, sorry, where Ke is the kinetic energy of an electron, W is the work function, and Hf is the energy of a photon. Um, and this equation is actually typically expressed as Hf, or the energy of a photon, equals kinetic energy plus the work function. In reality, ejected photoelectrons may have a range of energies. For example, electrons ejected from deeper within the metal may lose some of their energy on the way to the surface through collisions with other atoms, etc. Therefore, we can express the relationship more accurately um, by the equation HF equals kinetic energy max plus the work function. So this discovery really breathed life into the theory of quantum mechanics, providing scientists with a new perspective on atoms and chemistry. It solidified the idea that things at a quantum level can be quantized, offering a more accurate way to understand chemistry and the underlying principles governing the deepest levels of matter. That concludes this video. If anything was un unclear, please let me know in the comments. In the next video, we will explore photon momentum and the wave nature of matter, as well as the atomic spectra and the Bohr model of an atom. So thank you for watching. Until next time.